Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. In 2021, we still have Western governments uh, subjecting their citizens to COVID restrictions. Uh, we have toxic identity politics uh, tearing nations apart and allowing the West enemies to capitalise on these growing divisions to expand their own geopolitical influence. This breaking of nations, have, as we have witnessed over the past decade, has been carried out by uh, the nation's own citizens a major contributor to rising national self-hatred in the West is media and entertainment propaganda paid for and sold sold to uh, Western consumers by a number of prominent globalists who for years have operated in the shadows, exerting undue influence on governments. But uh, in the past year especially, their sinister activities are now gaining more scrutiny. Their aim is to centralise economic, legal and security powers into a number of global bodies. Uh, to do that, obviously, they need to dilute the sovereign strength and unity of nations. My guest tonight has been warning about the growing influence of global globalists and globalism uh, that are uh, having over our, our governments and culture. Uh, Richard Poe is an expert on the globalists, their beginnings and their influence. He is a New York Times bestselling author with his most notable book titled The Shadow Party, how George Soros, Hillary Clinton and the 60s radicals seize control of the Democratic Party. It was published uh, way back in 2007 and co-authored with uh, David Horowitz. Uh, Richard is also a, a documentary uh, producer and uh, also a lifelong uh, kayaking enthusiast. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. And I know it's uh, very early in the, the US at the moment, so I appreciate you uh, coming on at such an, an early hour to, uh, well, come on at uh, prime time here in Australia. It's my pleasure. Um, early to bed, early to rise. I, I'm an early riser. Well, it's the, the, the healthiest way to go, as they say. Uh, now, you uh, uh, first came to uh, our prominence in, uh, in the, what would you call it, uh, uh, talk show circuit uh, with your your book on on, jo on George Soros so uh, you appeared on the O'Reilly Factor and on Glenn Beck's programs and uh, I think Glenn Beck was one of the the first ones to make George Soros and his activities well known to a a wider audience of of people and he is obviously much 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 more uh, well known and people are aware of his activities more more now. Uh, but let's go back to the beginning of, of George Soros's life. Uh, how did his life start and how did he make his money? Well, um, George Soros uh, was a young uh, refugee from Hungary and uh, he came to uh, he, he left his native Hungary during the uh, early years of the communist regime there. He had already lived through the Nazi occupation. Uh, he and his family had gone into hiding as they were Jewish. Um, then when the communists came in, young George decided it was time to go. Uh, interestingly, um, Mr. Soros states himself that he didn't so much flee from communism. Actually, he had to be talked out of going to Moscow. His first impulse as a young man, I, I think he was probably about around 16 or 17 at the time, he discussed with his father, where should he go? And his first impulse was to go to Moscow and basically to join the communists and the, the uh, communist movement because he said that's where the power is. It was his father who said, no, don't go to Moscow, go to England. And the unspoken part of that story is, and I think Mr. Soros's father understood this better than young George did, I think what he was telling his son is, no, 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 even though, yes, you see this powerful Red Army occupying our country, don't be deceived. 
that is not where the real power is. It's not in Moscow. The real power in this world is in London. I believe this advice from his father was not only correct, but it steered the life of young George Soros for the rest of his life until this present day, because his father gave him good advice. The power was not in Moscow. The power was in London. And it wasn't in Washington either. It was specifically in London. And this is one of the messages that I try to bring people more than anything else these days, especially. I've known for 30 years the uh, about what I call the hidden influence of uh, British power or the British Empire, if if you'd want to call it that. They no longer call themselves that, but I think it's still appropriate. And George Soros is an integral part of that machine. He spent ten years in England. He uh, he uh, graduated from the London School of Economics. He based his entire foundation system on the principle of the open society, which he learned from his professor, Karl Popper, the philosopher who was teaching at the London School of Economics. And what they teach at that school very specifically, um, that school was set up by the Fabian Socialist Movement, which is uh, sometimes known as the liberal imperialist movement. It might be better described as the socialist imperialist movement since most people who uh, took part in this thing called liberal imperialism were actually socialists. But Karl Popper as a philosopher, now he was from Austria, he was a refugee like Soros, but he thoroughly imbibed the um, the elixir of English economics in the form of what came to be called political economy. This is the subject they teach at the London School of Economics. What they do at that school is they train people to be servants of the empire, to be servants of the global world order, which was actually built by the British. And this, I think, is what people fail to understand because our memories are so short. The world we live in today is an English-speaking world. If you don't speak English as your native language, you have to learn it as your second language. This is a world that is dominated by English-speaking peoples. It's right there in front of our faces, and it's obvious. Now, the myth is that the reason everybody speaks English is because there's this American empire, so-called, this American colossus. But I would argue, and there are a few other uh, researchers out there who, whom I could name uh, and perhaps will before this podcast is done, but th there, there have been a number of researchers who've looked past the obvious in this post-war world since 1945 and who have come to realize that, you know, the British are very good at understatement. They're very good at exercising power quietly and behind the scenes and not not making a, a display of their power. And I would contend, and some other researchers who studied this question would contend, that the United States is actually subservient to Britain, even to this day, that it's, you know, this whole kind of media propaganda idea that uh, the, the, the British are a lapdog or a poodle to the almighty American president. I, I think this is a propaganda narrative, which is just not true. And, and I think if you look at the history, you can see that it's not true. It's, it's really quite clear. It's not complicated. In fact, uh, I have an article that just went up today at lewrockwell.com, and it's called How the British Invented Globalism which speaks to this very subject. And it just goes through uh, the most, on the most obvious level what happened. And, and the most, by, by most obvious, we don't have to get into all the esoteric conspiratorial things here uh, yet, necessarily. Um, 
but on the most obvious level of plain history. The British Empire was supreme at the end of the 19th century, at the turn of the century. And at that time, it was widely understood and widely assumed that the, their power would continue to increase and we would live in a world under British rule. Now, British elites, British um, decision makers had been aware of their rising power for some decades and had been making plans for a world under British dominion. And the crucial element of this plan was to reacquire the United States, to bring the United States back into the British system. And hopefully, they hoped in a at least a somewhat subservient role where they would be able to quietly influence what America did by exercising uh, what we call soft power at the highest levels. And soft power is, well, it's, it's real power, but it's power that doesn't, it, it's not the exercise of military might necessarily. It's the power of bribery, corruption, and appealing to people one-on-one -on -one, uh, through familial relationships, through personal relationships, and basically identifying. It's, it's exactly the same technique that the British had always used, that they were experts at using in so many other countries throughout the world, which is to go into a colonial area and identify the elites, identify that small group of families, that small group of people who were corruptible and who were powerful, and to give them money, to give them praise, to give them attention, often intermarrying with them. That happened a lot with our American Anglophile elites. And through this means to create a culture, this inside the Beltway culture in Washington, D.C., which I will tell you, Tim, I don't know if you folks in Australia really understand this, but the elite Beltway Washington culture is Anglophilic to the core. They love Great Britain. There's nothing more important to them than to please the English. There is no diplomatic post that carries more prestige than to be the ambassador to the court of St. James. It seems strange to, to say this and for people to hear this because this is not the propaganda narrative of the mass media, but this is the way it is. These people in Washington want nothing better than to please the British. In their minds, we are still subservient to them. And yes, we have so much more money and so much more weaponry and so forth, but I would ask you to consider <clears throat> Excuse me. This has always been the situation um, with the British. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> when I, you know, when I first began speaking to people about this subject many years ago, people who were new to it, they would say, "Well, England is just a small little island. How, how could they have this power?" And I have to, I have to tell people, do you know that? England is the same size now that it was in 1850. Mm -hmm. it, it hasn't changed its size by one square centimeter since since the, the so-called um, you know peak of British power, which was supposedly more than a hundred years ago. They've always been small. They've always been resource poor, and they've always had. A, a shortage of manpower for doing things like massive military operations. And so the British became experts at manipulating other countries and other peoples to do what they want. And for example, the famous uh, massacre at Amritsar in 1919 in India, those were Indian troops. They were dressed in British uniforms. They were trained by the British. They were brainwashed to do as they were told. There was one British officer and hundreds of, I, I don't know how many hundreds of, Brit of Indian soldiers 
who massacred their own people. This is the genius of the British Empire. This is the secret of their power. It's psychological. They are masters at mass psychology. They are masters at getting people who are more numerous and physically powerful than them to do what they say. And this is how they acquired control. I would call it control or something close to control of the United States. And it happened this way. Prior to World War I, the British were already making plans they, to make war against Germany. They knew there would be a contest. Germany was on the rise. Germany was becoming a great manufacturing power and competing with the British. And worst of all, uh, Germany was building a great fleet which could compete with the British fleet on the high seas. So they launched an initiative called the Roundtable in which they sent operatives to all English-speaking countries, including Australia, including the United States, and semi-secretly, it was, it was very hush-hush, this roundtable operation, just as I described, going targeting people who were deemed to be up-and-coming elites, people who were opinion leaders and so forth, and getting them to enlist in this idea of imperial federation. The initial idea was to get all English-speaking countries in the world to join an actual federation uh, and to, act, in a sense, become the same country. Well, that didn't work. Nobody really wanted that. The Australians, the New Zealanders, the Canadians, everybody said, no, we want independence. And so instead, uh, the round table offered something else, which was this dominion arrangement where the English-speaking colonies would get uh, self-rule, they would be self-governing internally, but their foreign policy would be overseen from London. And this was the deal of dominion, which basically all the English-speaking colonies accepted in, the, in around the turn of the century, around, uh, I guess, between 1909 and um, maybe 1914, uh, around there. Now, in the U.S., it was a little more difficult because we had been formally independent since 1776, or if you like, since 1783. That's when England finally recognized our independence. And moreover, our relations with Britain had been quite stormy up to that point. Uh, people forget, uh, aside from the obvious problems of the Revolution, the War of 1812, there were also border disputes with Canada. Uh, there was um, British meddling in our civil war. There were a lot of problems. It, it, was not, it was a very uneasy relationship. But the British, being the very deliberate people that they are, they confronted this situation and they, they rolled out this initiative called the Grand Rapprochement in the 1890s. Uh, it was a huge public relations campaign to try to convince the Americans, us, that it was time to, to you know, um, mend bridges, mend fences, build bridges, and, you know, make friends again with our mother country. And it worked. And there were, there were many uh, so-called Americans who were going along with this to the point of being actual operatives of the British. One of them was Andrew Carnegie, the great steel magnate who basically built the American steel industry. Now, Carnegie was born in Scotland. He, he was really a Scot in his heart. He came to America. He made this fortune. But when the British launched this grand rapprochement, Carnegie got right up in front and he, he published books. He gave huge amounts of money through his foundations. All toward the goal of actually reincorporating the United States into the British Empire. Now, what happened, as we all know, it didn't quite go as planned. World War I started, and at first, Americans had wanted nothing to do with it. But uh, Woodrow Wilson 
had British spies very close to him in the White House. And one of these spies was a guy named uh, Colonel. He wasn't really a colonel, He'd, but um, he was called Colonel Edward House. He was a Texan. He had strong family ties to England. He and his brothers had attended boarding schools in England. His father was uh, English born. During the Civil War, Edward House, uh, that is his father, had run a blockade running operation basically for the British, uh, bringing in arms to arm the Confederate rebels and in exchange exporting cotton to the British for their textile industry. So this guy's father was basically a British agent and so was his son, Colonel Edward House. He was very close to our president, Woodrow Wilson. Now, every school child learned in school, at least they used to, I don't know what they teach in school. Nowadays, when I was in school, everyone said, our president Woodrow Wilson was an idealist. He believed in world peace. He believed we should have yeah, a that, league of nations. Yeah, exactly. But what, what people don't realize, and I cover this in my article, how the British invented globalism, which is on Lou Rockwell today. In fact, all of these so-called ideals had been spoon-fed to Woodrow Wilson by this cluster of British spies who were clustered around him. There was Colonel Edward House, who was in constant touch with uh, the British government at the highest level, with the British Foreign Office, comparing notes, telling them how everything's going with President Wilson. And then there was a man named uh, Sir William Weissman, who in fact was the, the US station chief for the British Secret Intelligence Service for, for the United States. He was intimate friends with Colonel House. House introduced him to the president and they all became friends together, even vacationing together. They, they became very intimate friends. And if you read certain histories of British intelligence, you'll see this man Weissman praised very highly as the greatest agent of influence who ever appeared in the history of British intelligence. And the reason he is, he is praised so highly is because he was able to uh, gain control of President Wilson with the help of Edward, Weiss, uh, Edward House, excuse me, and basically to persuade him to enter the war a little bit later than the British had wanted, but to enter the war on the side of Britain. And we lost over 100,000 men in that war. And furthermore, to get behind this idea of global government, this was the beginning of globalism, the League of Nations. Now, who thought of this? Was it Wilson? No. In a letter of 1915, um, I think his name was Sir Edward Gray. He was the British Foreign Secretary. He sent a letter to Colonel House saying, well, look, we, we'd like to start this uh, League of Nations, but we don't want to propose it ourselves. It would, it would be much better to have a U.S. president propose it. Do you think you could get President Wilson to propose this idea as his own? And Colonel House said, of course, no problem. And they, they got him to do it. So Wilson then got up there and said, let's have a League of Nations. It was a completely British idea from the get-go. The British had been talking about this and planning this for decades. In fact, H.G. Wells, the science fiction writer, had written about it at length in a book called The War to End War, published in 1914. And H.G. Wells, in saying this, was not just giving his own ideas, because Wells himself was an operative of Britain's War Propaganda Bureau, uh, known as Wellington House. And so he was simply doing his job as a propagandist and putting out this idea of a peace league, as he called it. And then, so he was, he was selling it to the public, H.G. Wells, saying, let's have a peace league after this war. And he wrote this only days after the war was declared. And then quietly through diplomatic channels and through, as I said before, familial channels, such as this man, Edward House.
whose father was born in Britain, etc. This is how soft power works. You see, we have had in our country since the very beginning, and I'm saying going back to the revolution, after the Battle of Yorktown, when we finally supposedly defeated the British army, the Continental Congress began expelling all so-called loyalists. We called them Tories in those days, people who were still loyal to England. They were, they were actually being expelled. Many of them went to Canada, some went to England, but we were trying to expel them all from the country. A little, uh, two years later, the peace treaty was signed in 1783, and one of the conditions of that peace treaty is stop expelling the loyalists. The British are very smart, as I said. They knew that if loyalist families, especially prominent ones, remained in the country... I'll, I'll bring it back to, because I, I started uh, asking about uh, George Soros's yes. early, early life, and you've explained through or a, a crash history lesson about how the, the, the United States uh, was enticed into globalism and, and that's fitting in why George Soros, after the war, believed that London was the source, uh, source of, of global power and given that the the center of global power in, in London in particular has always wanted to bring the, the US back into the globalist tent. That's why uh, George Soros and his political activities has been so focused on well, undermining the independence and the sovereignty of the, the United States. That's, that's always been his, his focus. Yes, that is absolutely correct. And this is, in a sense, the main message that I want to get out to people because way back when, when I started, when I first started writing about George Soros, now, now actually, you correctly mentioned that I, uh, I appeared on the O'Reilly Factor in 2004, and that was, um, that was the first time I had ever spoken out against Soros. But I'll tell you, in all honesty, the first thing I wrote about Mr. Soros was actually quite positive. This was back in 1993. I wrote a book called How to Profit from the Coming Russian Boom. It sounds a little ludicrous to some people now, but in those days, in 1993, everyone thought Russia was going to have a, a huge economic boom now that communism was dead and it was going to be like China is today. And so I wrote a very optimistic book, and I wrote about Mr. Soros. I, I actually called him, uh, his office, trying to get an interview, and uh, he couldn't do that. But he he uh, he allowed me to interview uh, some of his functionaries in Russia, and uh, so it was all very nice. And at that time, I I have to explain now. I was strictly a business writer at that point. I wrote about business and finance. And I was writing a, a book about the wondrous th changes happening in Russia and how we're going to have free enterprise and Russia was going to rejoin the Western world and it's all going to be so wonderful. And George Soros is helping to make this happen. Uh, a lot of people don't know this uh, about me. You know, they, they think I'm just some guy who hates George Soros and I quite, quite the contrary. I, I admired him back then. I, I knew he was into some sketchy things, but who isn't? Anyway, uh, I, I certainly supported and admired what he was doing in Russia to the extent I understood it. I wrote very positively. In a financial sense. Yes, yes. And bring in the sense of specifically helping to bring capitalism, quote unquote. This is how a lot of well-meaning people like me, like us, uh, get roped into uh, the globalist agenda by thinking somehow capitalism and free trade and all of these buzzwords somehow that's equate with human now. freedom right so i was very much into that mindset then i'll i'll admit it and i was really i will admit i was 
I was trying to please George Soros by writing about him, but it didn't work. He, he wasn't pleased. I, I think it, it was interesting. I, I had a conversation with a, a, um, a Greek businessman who apparently knew Soros right after that book came out. And he looked at me very strangely and he said, he said, you know, Soros is going to read your book. I said, no, no, he doesn't have time to read my stupid book. And he said, oh, no, you named him. You wrote his name. He will definitely read your book. He's very interested in anything anybody writes about him. And I said, really? Um, and I started feeling a little nervous. I was like, okay, well, I, I hope he'll approve. Well, I think he didn't approve because... Um, See, what I had done in that book is I pointed to the privatization process that was occurring. At that time, the Russian government was privatizing massive amounts of state-owned properties, and it was supposed to go to the Russian people. They were supposed to issue um, what they called vouchers of uh, worth 10,000 10, rubles. A piece, and each Soviet citizen was supposed to get one of these vouchers, and they could do whatever they wanted with it, sell it, uh, exchange it for more vouchers. Well, I was actually praised in the London Financial Times for being the first writer to really explain this process, and I thought, oh, great! I'm, I'm a, you know, the, the book was very well reviewed in all the right places, Library Journal, etc. But I kept having this nagging thing in my mind that this great businessman had told me, saying, oh, Soros will read your book. And I kept thinking, will Mr. Soros like my book? Well, I think he didn't, because uh, just a couple years later, another book came out, and it was called The Coming Russian Boom. Very similar title to my book. In, it, it was my book was how to profit from the coming Russian boom. This book was called the coming Russian boom, and it had a similar cover design. And right on the back was a huge blurb by George Soros saying, "This is the book to read. This is the, a real insider's look at Russia." And then a reviewer, who I later found out was a Soros operative, wrote a review saying, "Don't read Richard Poe's book." read this new book, The Coming Russian Boom. So they had basically replaced my book within two wow. years of publication. They replaced Very my book delighted. with another one, which was, which was stamped with the Soros stamp of approval. I, I felt so betrayed. No, not really. I'm just exaggerating. But I did feel like, well, gee, you know, uh, come on, George. Give me a break here. I, I tried to write nicely about your operations, but he, he didn't like it. I, I think what he didn't like, uh, assuming he really was personally involved in this, which, which seems to be the case, I think what he didn't like was the focus that I put on the privatization process, as the Financial Times had noted, because Soros was then deeply involved in corrupting that process through closed auctions uh, and through proxy relationships. Soros and other foreign businessmen bid for these 10,000 ruble vouchers, and they weren't supposed to by law. These were supposed to go to the Russian people, and they bought up all the vouchers. And then uh, around the same time, Soros and Jeffrey Sachs and all these uh, shock therapy economists tanked the Russian economy and and triggered hyperinflation in Russia so that these vouchers would be worth nothing. So when, when Soros and all these other Western operatives, and it's important to understand Soros is just one of many. Uh, this is the point that I would like to make. He's not the puppet master. He's not Dr. No. He's not what, what he's made out to be by the major media. He, he's, he's really kind of a psyop. He's a face who's put in front of us to look at and, in a sense, to mock us, to say, look, he's we got can do whatever we want. Excuse me? He's, oh, I've put his face up on the screen there. That's Yes, right. 
Yes, and and that's the interesting thing about him too. You know, when he famously broke the Bank of England, quote unquote, he immediately got up and started bragging about that, saying, "I broke the Bank of England." Now, people in that business, that currency arbitrage business, who who go around um, speculating in sovereign currencies and and doing terrible damage to countries. People in that business are extremely secretive. Let me tell you, the, the one thing they don't do is go on TV bragging about what they did because that's a really good way to get investigated and arrested. But that's what Soros did. He bragged about it. And the fact is his brag wasn't even true because there were many, many other individuals and institutions who did it with him who all wisely and typically kept their mouths shut and stayed out of the limelight. Soros deliberately came out into the limelight, and he's been known ever since as the man who broke the Bank of England. And he's not the man who broke the Bank of England. He was just part of a team. But he was the one who stepped forward as the front and took credit for it, a very unusual thing to do. And he's done that many, many times throughout the world in many countries. He has deliberately presented himself as the culprit so everyone can hate him and blame him when in fact he's he's only one of many culprits in some senses some senses he's there to distract attention from others for others more powerful others who are more deeply involved in these things than he actually is so um so in a way, uh, when Soros is described as what is it the the, the boogeyman that the the the, the, the right wing use to, to talk about the advancement of uh, progressive causes and and politics, that's somewhat true because obviously his uh, Open Society Foundation funnels money to various causes, but there's other. Soros type people in the background doing exactly the same thing as he he is quietly. Is that what you're alluding to? Yes. Um, let me be clear. Uh, everything that's been said about Soros, about all of his wicked schemes throughout the world to undermine sovereignty, to change our culture, um, to break economies, and and to force globalism on people who don't want it. All of that is totally true. George Soros is everything he's been accused of being. I'm not trying to get him off the hook, but I am saying that Mr. Soros, he's not the puppet master, as Glenn Beck famously called him. Um, he's, he, he's more of a, a middle manager. He is part of this globalist um apparatus he's a very important part but the part that he plays as far as i can tell is not so much an operative role as it is um a media role he he's 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 a his job almost is to present a certain face to the media and this is why he has such a strange dual nature on the one hand He's a currency speculator, of all things. On the other hand, he's a, a human rights activist. How do you put those two things together? Well, they they go yeah, together. A lot of democratic politicians yeah. over in the West. Correct. Now, now, the thing is, putting crass self-interest in the form of things like currency speculation and regime change and coupling that with a pretense of being interested in human rights. This is the essence of British imperial policy. George Soros did not invent this. The British empire invented human rights. They invented the whole concept of human rights and of using human rights as a tool of power in order to intimidate and manipulate other countries. This was a British invention long before Mr. Soros was born, but he That's learned it. No cold human rights, because everyone has different 
views on what are human rights. Correct. Correct. And the official human rights that are pushed by globalist organizations are, of course, very, very different from the human rights that you and I, that normal people would regard as U.S. Bill of Rights. Yes. Now, um, it, to, to this end, I would give an example. Um, there was, uh, you may remember, I think it was last year, Alan Dershowitz came out and made a curious announcement. He said, he said, I have evidence that um, President Obama conspired with George Soros to get the FBI to investigate someone and that Obama did it. He said very provocatively. And he said, and this is all going to be litigated, he said, and very soon. Well, eight months went by, nothing happened. So um, I wrote an article or really a multi-part thread on Twitter um, basically giving my view, of uh, my theory as to what Mr. Dershowitz was talking about. I believe the man he was referring to was an Israeli billionaire named Benny Steinmetz. Mr. Steinmetz is currently suing George Soros in federal court uh, in New York, here in the U.S. He's suing him for $10 billion, and he's suing him for defamation, extortion, tortious interference with business, all these other things. And basically what happened, according to Mr. Steinmetz, if you read the court papers, it's still in court. I think it was filed in 2017, and the motions are flying back and forth. It's still in court. What Mr. Steinmetz alleges against Mr. Soros is that basically Soros came in with his whole human rights um, apparatus in, in cahoots with Tony Blair and a number of other British figures. Um, Lord Malik Brown was involved and, and a few others. The, the usual crowd of people that Soros does his operations with. And they went into the African nation of Guinea and they got close to the president, uh, a guy named Alpha Conde, and basically convinced him to rescind uh, some mineral rights uh, agreements they had made with Benny Steinmetz. Now, you'll be interested to know as an Australian that um, the Anglo-Australian firm of Rio Tinto was working in cahoots with Mr. Soros on this operation. They had a big uh, a so-called iron, uh, iron ore concession uh, from the Guinean government. And they weren't doing anything with it, allegedly, or for many years. So then Benny Steinmetz came in and said, give it to me. I'll invest all this money. I'll build a railroad. I'll develop it. So Mr. Steinmetz made a deal with the Guinean government. Rio Tinto went crazy. They said, that's our concession. You stole it. You must have bribed somebody, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, George Soros appears with this whole human rights parade saying, Benny Steinmetz is a corrupt um, a Western mineral extractor who's unfairly treating the native people of Africa. And uh, along with Mr. Soros were the usual crowd of human rights NGOs, one global witness prominent among them, accusing him of all kinds of corruption, bribery, what have you, and basically uh, succeeded in getting him uh, uh, arrested and investigated in half a dozen different countries, including the U.S., Switzerland, his native Israel, uh, France, I think. All over the world, he was under criminal investigation. And what was interesting about this is that Rio Tinto later admitted that they had been involved in bribery in, in connection with these matters, but somehow that was okay. So Steinmetz was specifically targeted by George Soros, and there is an allegation in the complaint, in Mr. Steinmetz's complaint, that in 2011, 
George Soros met with President Obama and arranged for all these investigations to happen. This is an allegation. I don't know what proof he has. But I wrote a, an article on Twitter basically saying, I think this is what Dershowitz is talking about. Because when Dershowitz said, you know, somebody met with Obama, Soros met with Obama and got him an FBI investigation against someone, that's what I thought. I thought that sounds like Benny Steinmetz. So I put it out there, attracted no attention, you know, totally ignored. Um, so who knows, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, we'll see what happens in court. But this is the kind of thing that, that uh, this is the way that human rights campaigns can work with corrupt imperial and campaigns. Using the, the, the power and influence of these NGOs, and we haven't even got on to the, the media influence as well. If you, if, you, if you get the NGOs to say that this, uh, uh, they can do Mr. Soros's dirty work for him, and so can mm -hmm. the media, so they demonize well, the, the, the businessman that you just described, and then they can get the, the deal, then there's no more scrutiny. Uh, exactly, exactly. And um, so what happens is that the human rights angle just becomes another weapon of empire. And this goes way back all the way to the beginning. Um, you may recall from history that uh, part of the pretext for the Zulu war was accusing the Zulu king of human rights violations. So this is nothing new. This has been going on, and it's an integral strategy of British imperial policy, which the British basically invented and perfected, and of which they are the masters. Um, now, I would mention another thing about Mr. Soros. I, I do have the dubious distinction of ha having been one of the first, maybe the first, uh, American journalists to start making an issue out of Soros's involvement in what are called color revolutions. There were a lot of people who didn't like Soros. They saw he was giving money to all kinds of bad causes, but and people were beginning to write about this, let's say around 2004. But there was one subject no one would talk about, and that was Soros's regime change operations his involvement in what what we now call color revolutions, which is organizing uh, basically fake elections, where, where overturning an election through orchestrated crowd actions, bringing in international vote counting. Yes, I, uh, uh, around about that time, 2004, Ukraine comes to mind. Is that what you're going to be talking about? Yes, the Ukrainian Orange Revolution is one of the most notorious examples, and it's certainly known that Soros was involved. But there were many, many others. The overthrow of um, Slobodan Milosevic in 2000, um, many, many of these operations. And this topic, although it was widely written about in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet states, which is how I knew about it, if you read Russian publications and such, th this was a very well-known fact that Soros was involved in these, these operations. Soros himself bragged about them, actually. It shouldn't have been a secret issue or a secretive issue because he wrote in his books, he wrote in his articles, he bragged about them. But for a journalist, and especially a, a journalist who was deemed to be in opposition to the you know, the State Department Council in, on Foreign Relations establishment to speak of this and to speak of it negatively instead of praising Mr. Soros for doing this, uh, criticizing him for it. This was strictly forbidden. It was such a third rail. If you spoke of these things, you would be called a conspiracy theorist, a nutcase, an anti-Semite, everything. They, they would just... Um, it was it was it was the third rail as a journalist as a working journalist full time which i was at that time this was simply not permitted 
And so I wrote about it for Newsmax magazine in the May 2004 issue of Newsmax. And what happened is uh, I had I was actually one of the original columnists at Newsmax, so I, I knew Chris Ruddy pretty well. Chris Ruddy, the founder and editor of Newsmax. Who, uh, was also, well, I, I should ex explain, he uh, came to prominence uh, uh, by questioning the, the, the suicide of uh, the, the Clintons' former, uh, 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 former counsel. His name escapes me now. Uh, Vincent uh, Foster. Yes, yes. Uh, and he was hatcheted on, on 60 Minutes uh, US about it. Correct. Yes, um, I, I have tremendous admiration for Chris and uh, everything that he's done. Um, as he became more of a mainstream media person, Newsmax got bigger, investors started coming in. He moved away from the Vincent Foster type of stuff, tried to become more mainstream, and that's fine. I mean, you know, you got to make a living. I get it. Oh, Newsmax is, it's evolved into a website and now TV channel. You would, Correct. It, you would still say that it's very bold in its uh, reporting and editorial stance much more than Fox News. Ab absolutely. I, uh, I love Newsmax. I think it's a very important voice in the media. Um, but what happens is, and, and it's happened to me as well, I, I like to say we're all controlled opposition to some extent. We, we all, as you get higher up the food chain, you start getting on national TV shows, whatever. You start. You have to become more careful. Mm. And what happened? I I guess I was a little less careful than others, um, because I felt I was onto a very big story with this Soros thing. And so I ended up pursuing it for a number of years, and um, maybe a little bit longer than I should have. But now what happened in 2004, so Chris called me up. He said, let's do, let's do a, a cover story, an expose of George Soros. I said, okay, fine. At that point, I'd never written a single negative word about the man. As I described, the only thing I'd ever written about him almost 10 years earlier was positive things in my book about Russia. But uh, I, I certainly knew he was doing bad things. So um, I get a call from Chris, and basically uh, he gave me this golden opportunity. He says, we'll put it on the cover. You can just say whatever you like, expose George Soros. And I discovered that um, there was a guy named Nick Simonek. Uh, he was a British guy, um, very upper crusty, you know, British sort of gentleman um, who was working with Chris on this. And... Um, he, he, he's dead now. He, he died a few years ago. But um, I got the impression this Nick Simonek, I don't even know if he disagreed politically with Soros, but he just didn't like him. I think he was his neighbor in the Hamptons, and he said, you know, he's an ill-mannered man. He's just, he has no class, this and that. He seemed to dislike him personally, but whether he disliked him politically, I don't know. So anyway, it was Chris and this guy, Nick, sort of egging me on, to, let's get Soros. And to make a long story short, we published the story. It was a big hit. I was on the O'Reilly Factor. The very next day after the O'Reilly Factor, an outfit called Media Matters for America just did a full court press against me. I, they, just, they, they just said, Richard Poe, how could, how could Fox News, how could a respectable news organization have a guy like like Richard Poe talking about George Soros and saying, um, what's that guy's name who runs Media Matters? David Brock. Uh, David, Brock. Yeah. Yeah. David Brock had an open letter to O'Reilly saying, I demand equal time to go <laughs> on your show and defend George Soros. And it was CC to Roger, A excuse me, to Roger Ailes. <laughs> Uh, and then they just kept going and going and going, really hammering. First, they did all this stuff saying that I was a liar. I got all my facts wrong. 
that I'm a, a right wing extremist or whatever. And um, then they started hitting on O'Reilly, really hitting on him. How could you? How could you do this? What kind of journalist are you? What don't you think about your reputation? So this was kind of the beginning of this these uh, uh, fact checking uh, disinfo police type of operations. Media Matters well, for America was the first early form of cancel culture. You could say exactly, exactly. So I was stunned. I, I'd never experienced anything like that before. Ever and and um, at that time I was a, quite a prominent author. I, I mean I, I was a, I'd been a full time author for ten years. V very few people uh, have done that. It, you know, the, usually people who write books have a day job. I all I did was write books, um, and so I was used to being on TV. I was used to being a public figure to some extent, but I'd never been slammed like that. I was quite, quite shocking. And I, I have to say, I didn't like it. I, I, it made me a little uncomfortable, but I thought, okay, well, I'm writing about politics now. And so I have to, I have to toughen up, you know, and, and step up to the plate and all that. So, um, but what happened was I wanted to keep writing about, Soros, I had a regular column at Newsmax, and what happened is they didn't let me. And I don't blame Chris for this. Um, I don't blame Nick Simonek, the late Nick Simonek. What happened is the chairman of Newsmax Media at that point was a guy named Lord William Rees Mogg. And that name may or may not be familiar with you. Yes, it is familiar. Um, there's, uh, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg is his son. So Lord William Rees-Mogg, who died in 2012, he was the, actually the chairman of Newsmax. And he stepped in, um, and I was there when it happened. I, I, we had a, a meeting over, over lunch. All the top Newsmax executives were there. We, we were all there. And Chris and Nick were on either side of Reese Mogg and basically trying to make him understand, you know, Soros is a bad guy. We've got to go after him. And Reese Mogg, um, he didn't go for it. And Reese Mogg was calling the shots. And that's one of these examples that I can give you from my personal experience of how British influence is there. Although, I mean, how many people even knew that Reese Mogg was chairman of Newsmax during that time? They they have they they have a positive genius. The British, I mean, have a positive genius for exercising soft power in countries where they want to kind of steer and guide things. So anyway, um, Chris was very nice about it. He was very honest and very nice, and um, he said, "Well, Reese Mogg's not going to let us go after Soros anymore." And I said, "Fine." And um, I could have kept writing for Newsmax, uh, you know, just avoiding the subject. But uh, what can I say? I was young. I was full of fight, you know, and I felt I was on to a big story and I just wanted to keep going. And so uh, I went back to the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I had previously worked there. I had been the editor of his website front page earlier. And I went back, David hired me back, and I, he was launching a new website called Discover the Networks, which was aiming to make a, a kind of comprehensive database of all the left-wing people. Um, of course, you know, the, the Horowitzian view is that it's all the left, this entity called the left. Um, and it is to some extent, but... I don't think the left would exist without a lot of state level support from governments. So to call it the left is a, it's well, not the way I would do it now. When so, you look at uh, just uh, <laughs> fast forwarding to the, the present day, when you uh, look at uh, modern 
progressive or left groups such as Antifa and Black Lives Matter and like where do they get their their funding from to or in Antifa's case basically just right in Portland uh, every every night organize on such a a mass scale and of course uh, they get their uh, glowing mainstream media coverage despite what uh, what they do there's there's got to be a, le- a level of either funding protection for them to just do that constantly with hardly any consequences and despite all the especially antifa supporters who are arrested there just seems to be more foot soldiers that come come, uh, come out yes uh, and that's exactly the point you you hit the nail on the head and um in fact, this was the subject uh, of the book that I wrote with David Horowitz. Um, if you don't mind a little shameless promotion. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. <laughs> Put it up right on the screen so, there. The Shadow Party by David Horowitz and Richard Poe. And it's subheaded, How George Soros, Hillary Clinton, and 60s Radicals Seized Control of the Democratic Party. And this book is still selling very well to this day and the reason is because it's not a it's not a time sensitive book it's really a historical book it goes all the way back in time to the 1930s 40s 50s 60s and shows how this apparatus was set up this apparatus of color revolution how it was set up in the united states and at the core of these operations what you were just talking about how do we get so-called street radicals who are supposedly rebels against the system why are they being supported by the mass media and the government and now we're we're after the the um the election we're going into an even more surreal phase where pro-trump protesters are dangerous terrorists and insurrectionists, but these Antifa people are somehow the voice of of the masses and whatever. And they're they're condoned and they're sponsored and major corporations uh, praise them and give money to them. Well, David and I discussed how this works. It's, It's an old Well, you could think of it as an old communist tactic. Let's call it that. It was a communist tactic, but there's another story of what is communism and who really invented it. Maybe we can't get into that now. But yes, it was a communist tactic. Lenin spoke of it. It was called pressure from above and below. And what this means is you infiltrate a government, a target government, to a sufficient extent that you, you pretty much, um, you have you have you have control, and so you have co- politicians. Basically, what you do is you get revolutionaries in the street. That's the pressure from below, going around, raising hell, burning, looting, terrorizing everybody, getting everyone scared. And then you get politicians, that's the pressure from above, saying, oh, my goodness gracious, the people are angry. The people... The people... The people and AOC and the squad. Exactly. And the people want um, to defund the police. And the people want this and the people want that. And all the things that the people supposedly want, all you have to do is go to the, the United Nations website and look at all their programs, and that's what they want. It's all there, climate change, depopulation, uh, you name it. Somehow the people, these crowds of mysterious, mysteriously funded and organized people, they all want all of the agendas that you see set forth. On uh, Go to any website of any UN-sponsored NGO, yeah, including... Exactly, uh, exactly. And you can go to these. Go to George Soros' Open Society Institute, which used to have um, official consultative status uh, with the UN. I think they don't now for some odd reason. 
But a, a lot of these groups have what they call consultative status. That's a whole other story. But basically, these NGOs, although they call them non-governmental organizations, they are actually governmental organizations. They're state actors. They're in a, essentially licensed, financially supported, and run by the governments. And the reason they're run, the actual purpose of these organizations, as described in our book, The Shadow Party, is to create the illusion of grassroots support for all, all these stupid, crazy ideas that the government or certain bad actors in the government are bringing down from above. So you have the pressure from above, the government, then you have the pressure from below, the protesters, and it all comes together like the two jaws of a shark. And we get crushed in between. And so what happens when these operations are unfolding is that we, the people, ordinary people, we're, we're watching TV or we're going on Twitter and we're saying, who are these people? Why are there people marching in the street wanting to defund the police? What are they, crazy? Who would want to do that? And, and we don't see any of our people protesting because if, if our people protest, you know, they're... <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna get arrested and you know oh, and, uh, far right extremists or exactly or domestic terrorists is yeah. the new is a new thing and so this is a psychological operation and it's it's called a color revolution this is an integral part of this thing called color revolution and it's a way of changing governments and changing policies in so-called democracies uh, but going outside of the democratic process. You simply have corrupt politicians who've been paid off or who've been blackmailed, sexually blackmailed in many cases. You mentioned Epstein. Uh, he's one very important player or he was, assuming he's actually dead. Um, these well, are... I think you, oh, to bring up a current example, what's uh, happening to, to Matt Gates at the moment, where he's being accused of a, a very, well, very pro Trump congressman being accused of uh, all sorts of, well, when they, they use the term sex trafficking uh, 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 of girls who are 17. Uh, there's no smoking gun to to say that he's he's done all these things, but there's all these. They claim they have these all their financial records, and that a lot of people suspect that that is some sort of uh, stitch up on him to to smear, get rid of him. Yeah, I, I would definitely. I don't know the details on that, but I, I, I would definitely presume innocence until guilt is proved. That this is our Anglo-Saxon tradition. Um, you know, and uh, I think we should stick with it. Um, but the fact is, you know, many people are innocent and many people are guilty of all kinds of indiscretions and even crimes. And some, some of the worst criminals uh, are allowed to go scot-free and some minor offenders are hit very hard, you, you know, so... There's, there's, there's not, it's not black or white, you know, especially when you get into these kinds of very personal allegations, you know, people who have old girlfriends and old and, mm -hmm. and uh, former wives out there, you know, once you have, once you have uh, state level um, national security operatives going out there interviewing everybody's exes, God help us all. I mean, seriously. some of that stuff is is happening in a, in Australia at the moment, with historical allegations being brought up to uh, smear uh, senior politicians. I won't I won't get into that with you, but my my local audience will will know uh, what I, what I'm talking about. And and going back to as as you talked about this above and be, below, and mm -hmm. this is why you can get a a situation where person a politician such as joe biden who's been in polit national politics for 48 years uh can run for president on a platform i'm going to uh change 
everything, make a uh, uh, seed to all of your protesters' demands, and we're, we're finally going to be a, a unified uh, u- u- utopian nation. Yes, and what happens when, when you're in the, the grip of this pressure from above and below, when you're stuck in the middle, is despair. What you feel is despair and apathy. It's very cleverly designed to, uh, by behavioral psychologists. It's scientifically designed to create an effect of total despair where you feel everyone's against me. I have common sense. I know it's a stupid idea to defund the police, but look, the government is, is against me. The people are against me. Everyone's rioting in the streets. I must be all alone. I must be the only person. Well, add still- in the, 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 the corporations and, well, uh, we were talking about the, the cancel culture that happened to you back in, in 2004. Mm. Twitter wasn't mm. even around then. It's so easy if you just speak some common sense. You can be targeted, lose your job, uh, have the, the, the mob can, can target, target you uh, online uh, and even in real life as well. Yes, yes, it, and it, it's, it's a great power, but the important thing to understand is it's government power. These fake protesters in the streets would not exist without state actors. They might be contractors, they may be quote-unquote private contractors who are contracted by the state. In some cases, they might be direct government, direct involvement by government agencies, going on but it's the government itself it's the government itself and this is this is what uh david and i were talking about in in the shadow party and what we showed what we showed is that this has been going on this has been building up and developing since at least the 1930s in in our country and we showed this tremendous apparatus Uh, It's an ideological apparatus and it's an institutional apparatus that has been created in our country. And we showed how certain people, especially George Soros, had come to be in charge of it at that time, or at least in a very prominent position uh, in the organization. But um, the the thing is, there's a whole other level to this, which, which is the direct government involvement. So I think it's important and it's great to, um, to ask the question that you're asking, to say, well, who are these globalists that we see staring out at us from the TV? George Soros, uh, Bill Gates, um, Klaus Schwab, people like this, these, and, and these, the, you know, there used to be uh, David Rockefeller, the late David Rockefeller always used to be trotted out as one of them. Um, and they, it's almost as if these people are selected from central casting. They're, they're just lone people as if they're characters from a James Bond movie. Uh, Dr. Yes. No, he, yes. Exactly. Exactly. They don't, they seem to have no real connection with anybody else. But the real story is these are state actors. They are state actors. Bill Gates, perfect example. You asked, uh, uh, how does a guy like this get power? Well, all for, for so many years, we've been told, well, Bill Gates was this really smart, nerdy guy. In college, he started you know, writing software, and he was very inventive and creative. And all of a sudden, he's the richest man in the world and the most powerful software company in the world. And because he has so much money, he's gotten interested in population control because he wants to do something good for the world. And gee, we have too many people in the world, so we have to get rid of them. We have to get the population below a billion people. And this all supposedly came out of the head of some college kid who is supposedly nobody special, just good at computers, and he somehow created this this gigantic well, he's corporation. He's not involved in uh, Microsoft anymore. He is basically full time at the Bill right. and Melinda Gates Foundation, and well, for the 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 past uh, year and a bit now has been the the go to person about uh, 
what's needed to to end uh, the, the 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 pandemic and even uh, early on use the 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 phrase what is that uh, the the final solution to the pandemic is the the vaccines he actually said that to, to Stephen Colbert once and he says what is that the end the end of the pandemic will be 2022 and then all there's the footage from him years back talking about a possible coronavirus pandemic i'm not saying anything about any of those things just that's just what he said yes and and um that's that's absolutely right and the thing about bill gates is we only recently learned that his father was a very prominent person involved with all these globalist agendas he was he was on the board of planned parenthood planned parenthood is one of the oldest, most powerful NGOs in the UN system. This is all the UN system we're talking about. That's what they call it. It's the, a system of non-governmental organizations, so-called, which are actually state actors working for the global government. Planned Parenthood has a, a an odious history going back decades of doing forced sterilizations of native people in South America, all kinds of things like that. All of these, these um, deep state uh, CIA types of agendas, they've been intimately involved with these things for so long. And Bill Gates uh, Sr. was a director of that organization. So the whole myth that, you know, bright, nerdy college kid, Bill Gates somehow invented some software and then he became the great philanthropist who wants to depopulate the world. Strangely, his father somehow was deeply involved in this too. And I think this is what really lies behind these kind of, um, these, these front people, as I was describing, people like Soros and Gates and um, Klaus Schwab, I think if we look into these people more deeply, what, what we're going to find is they, they were selected, yes, partly because they had certain talents um, and certain ability to get in front of a camera and communicate a certain type of persona. But they were also selected, I think, because of their family connections, because they came from families that were deeply connected with this globalist agenda going back for many generations. And this is why I think it's important now. It's a decision that I've made where I, I'm, I'm currently writing a, a, a history of globalism. I, I feel it's important. There's, you know, there's a lot of good people writing about the latest news and what's happening, and that's really vital. But people are we're reaching this point where people need a little more depth they need to understand how did we get here how did we get in such a bizarre situation how did we get to a situation where there is such such corruption at the top and uh where there just doesn't seem to be anybody who's on the side of the people and i believe the answer is that the system we're grappling with right now, even though it uses a lot of shiny new words like Great Reset and uh, uh, Agenda 21. Uh, build Back Better. Is, build, uh, yeah, Build Back Better. They always have new words that they present us with. But the agenda itself is very old. It's the agenda of a small group of people in most cases, if not all cases, I think people who come from very deep, highly valued bloodlines, people uh, who have what we might call aristocratic roots or some other valued bloodline for some reason, families that have been in these positions for centuries and maybe more than just centuries. And... I can't, I can't speak with any authority about Mr. Soros or Gates or Schwab, what their ultimate family history, history is, but I'm guessing, just from what I've seen with so many others, 
I'm guessing that their families are much more special than we think they are. Bill Gates, college student who just uh, invented Microsoft, Ger um, Klaus Schwab, uh, I think he was an engineering professor, smart guy, I'm sure he was great at engineering, but how come he's practically running the world all of a sudden? How about the up and coming, uh, you would up and coming globalist entrepreneurs, you could describe it, such as Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, his sort of story to uh, just being in, in college, uh, cre uh, creating this social network, it's similar to, to Gates and, and Microsoft. And Elon Musk, he's, he, he polarizes a lot of people. He's this eccentric uh, uh, businessman with these. Uh, uh, elect, electric electric vehicles that he wants to, wants to go to, to Mars. Some people absolutely love him. Others find he is in how he wants to invest in in transhumanism abhorrent. I'd be keen to get the, your perspective on on those two up and comers. And there's a few well, uh, there's a few others who um, would be around as well. Well, you know. All I can say is um, I, I don't have anything specific to say about them other than they just, certainly, especially with Zuckerberg, he definitely seems to fit the mold that I'm talking about. We're, again, a story of a college student who just invented something. There's a lot of articles uh, showing um, pretty convincingly that Facebook began as, as um a, a military intelligence project, a DARPA project. Uh, I think it was called LifeLog. And somehow it ended up in the hands of this guy Zuckerberg. Uh, I think um, all of these people, you, you know, the, 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 especially the high-tech businesses, but not only them, the, the fact is, you know, people like me, and I was really a true believer. I was a libertarian. I believed in the free market. Um, I was never quite what you'd call a market fundamentalist, but I really did believe I was one of those people, you know, when communism fell, I felt we're going to have a golden age. Communism has fallen. We're going to have capitalism and free trade and free markets and everybody will prosper and and so forth part of me i knew enough then to suspect that there would be bad actors who would somehow corrupt the whole process i didn't understand how quickly or how thoroughly they would corrupt the process especially in russia and especially with the help of george soros and, and certain others um the the um as I described the privatization process, which was supposed to transfer the Soviet infrastructure, the wealth built by the Soviet Union into the hands of the people, totally hijacked by bad actors from the West, including Mr. Soros. And this is just a, a small part of what constantly goes on, where we really don't have a free market. It, it's we don't it, maybe it's true maybe this utopian idea that if people were free to buy and sell according to their own interests somehow we would have a just society maybe in a perfect world that would be possible but i i no longer believe it's possible in this world because the wickedness of man is too great and because because of these old families who have been playing this game for so many centuries, J just think of the wealth that these people have. And when I say these people, I'm talking about who were the founders. Think of it. We're 500 years ago, Columbus sailed to America, uh, Vasco da Gama sailed around Africa, and suddenly we had the age of exploration. And basically, European white people conquered the entire world, or at least those from a s small handful of countries in Europe, basically conquered the entire planet. Well, that enterprise of conquering and developing the planet was a highly organized enterprise, and it was organized 
in the form of joint stock companies. The, the, every time an expedition was sent out, uh, certainly this was the case with um, England and Holland. I, I don't, I'm not sure how the Portuguese and Spanish handled this, but let's say uh, a, an expedition went out from England. I certainly know with the American colonies, each time there was a, a joint stock company formed and the crown would get a certain share and the directors, the people who owned it were, um, you know, they weren't just anybody. They were, they were important people. They, the people with, uh, in many cases of the nobility, uh, sometimes people of the so-called merchant class, but very wealthy, powerful people. So these were the ground level investi uh, investors. Think of it. 500 years ago, imagine if you were a ground level investor in the Massachusetts Bay Colony or some other, all the, all the 13 colonies of the United States or anywhere around the world. There were ground level investors. There were certain people who invested and they have, the, the gains they have realized from 500 years ago to this day, I have to think those gains were not lost. I, I'm, I'm not aware that anyone ever dissolved those corporations or took the money and gave it to some charity or I don't know. They mentioned uh, John, John Rockefeller, who uh, the, the Rockefeller uh, family first uh, came to, to prominence in the, in the United States in the late 19th century. Their, their influence today is, is, is still ever present. They, they, they still have members of the family as, as politicians. One, Nelson Rockefeller, was, was vice president. They just seem to live on. The same with the, uh, uh, the Morgan family as well. Uh, yes, th that's true. Um, although, again, this is my particular perspective. You may not share it, but I... I I'm always uh, interested and a little troubled by the fact that the figures that we are allowed to be familiar with, people like J.P. Morgan and, and John D. Rockefeller, the, we're told these are, are you know, the, the big, um, the, the richest men in the world, the, 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 the men who created this modern globalist uh, monstrosity that we're living with today. And yet when you look at their life stories, similar to Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, basically these people are nouveau riche. These are people who supposedly didn't become rich until 100, 150 years ago. So who had all the money before then? And some, some, some of the names we're familiar with, those of us who research these kinds of things, we we become familiar with certain names that always come up. Some of them are a little older than 100, maybe they're 200, 250 years ago. But, you know, Tim, 250 years ago is nothing. You know, uh, it's really a very short time. And I just, I'll tell you quite frankly, I don't believe that the richest people in the world are people who just made their money in the last couple hundred years. That makes no sense to me for, for the reason I said, because there's been so much investment for so long in such profitable enterprises, especially in the last 500 years, the enterprise of conquering the entire world. John D. Rockefeller was not a ground level investor in the conquest of the world. He came along after it was already conquered. I think the money is older. I think people like Morgan and Rockefeller are nouveau riche. And I'm getting more interested now in the old money. Who is the old money? How far back does it go? And how much money do they really have? And where do they keep it? You're not going to see these people on the Forbes 400 list because they have tax havens and shell corporations. They have all kinds of ways of concealing their wealth. And how much do they really have? I think that's a really important question for people to start thinking about these days, in my humble opinion. 
Oh, you're certainly going to get me to, to start asking that question uh, as well. Hopefully with your, your upcoming book, uh, you can provide some answers. Now, obviously the Trump presidency was an aberration in the advancement of these globalist goals. He was not meant to be president. And for the four years of his presidency, the, the deep state mainstream media were at him all the time. And when uh, I say deep state, I'm not just talking about the uh, intelligence agencies. They're also the the uh, the bad actors you talked about. The that's when during the pre Trump presidency, that's when the the Antifa uh, riots uh, began, and mm -hmm. they eventually got him in 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 twenty in the twenty twenty election, and obviously the way that I described January six, it was just a bizarre unfolding of events the fact that the u.s capitol the supposedly one of the most secure buildings in the world could be breached with weird q QAnon people able to go into the the, the chamber and biden claims that that that's uh, it's the the one of the worst events in democracy what is it chuck schumer compared it to pearl harbor and 9-11 it's you obviously uh, would have observed the the, the Trump uh, presidency and uh, it, its end. Just how much did that disrupt things as they were meant to be? Well, um, you know, the, as far as the election itself, of course, that's that's being litigated right now, and. Um, so I, I'm not going to I'm not going to speak to to that too much, except that it's oh, you being, can't on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But it's being litigated, and I'm quite sure we're going to get some answers about that. But uh, it kind of goes back to this issue of pressure from above and below, because here was an instance where a president was trying to trying to do the same thing that the the uh, usual color revolution crowd does. Uh, the, the, this uh, cluster of NGOs that Soros and people like that work with, who, they were doing the same thing. They were saying, um, oh, there's been a stolen election, so let's take to the streets and let's make ourselves heard. You know, in, in Yugoslavia uh, in uh, 2000, a color revolution that was partly funded by George Soros and, and others. Um, the, they marched on the parliament building and set fire to it. And, um, you know, they had heavy military equipment. They had, they had automatic weapons. They had um, artillery at, at checkpoints around the city of Belgrade. And uh, and they literally set fire to the parliament building, and, and uh, a few people were killed. And this was this was praised as a wonderful thing. And so, this strangely over the top reaction to the January sixth um, protests is part of the psycho psychological operation that I was describing, where. What they're doing is they're they're using behavioral psychology on us to say, look, they're putting it right in our face. They're saying, if protesters approved by us do something, it's okay. If your protesters do something, you will be treated as domestic terrorists, and you will be you will be uh, treated very harshly. And this just feeds into the despair. The whole point is despair. Remember, the pressure from above is the government. The pressure from below are the protesters. And we in the middle are made to feel there is no hope. The government is against us. The so-called people are against us. And if our own people, our own protesters try to do anything, they will be mercilessly crushed by the state. It's all part of the same psychological operation whose purpose is to make us feel that we have no options 
that the government is totally against us, the military is against us, the national security apparatus is against us, and there is no hope. How do you make how do you make an enemy surrender? You drop leaflets on them saying, you're surrounded, you have no way out, you have no hope, surrender. So that's what they're saying to us. And I can't really tell you or anyone else how we should address this other than to say my my approach has been to to sit back and say okay i have certain skills i have a certain track record uh, certain research that i've been doing for many years let me just focus on that and try to get this book out that will help people to understand at least something important about how this apparatus works. I don't have to solve the whole problem. I'm just one person. We can't be an army of one. We we have to have faith that that good will prevail. And you know, I, I don't know what you believe. I, I do believe in fate. I believe in destiny. I believe in God. I believe that if you act on faith that somehow or other it will turn out for the good. Maybe it's not true, it, but it's what I believe, and it's what, it's what keeps me going. So each of us has our own area of competence and ability, and I feel the best thing we can do at a time like this is to focus very close, at least the best thing I can do, focus very closely on my area of competence the thing that I know how to do, the thing that I've been doing for many years, which is connecting dots, researching, and just trying to figure out what's going on, and just have faith that somehow that knowledge might help others to understand things and to see where we should go next in, in my own small way. And I think all of us have those areas of competency um, you with your podcast and, and whatever else you're doing, I'm sure you're doing a lot. Somehow we all have to just, we have to ignore the PSYOP. We have to ignore the pressure from above and below. This PSYOP that's being played on us to make us think there's no hope. Of course there's hope. And the hope comes specifically from realizing that pressure from above and below is at its base an illusion. The whole reason this, uh, this type of operation is pursued is to create a, a great delusion in the minds of people that we're outnumbered, that there's all these nutcases out there who want to have the great reset and who, who um, want to be transhuman and all this kind of stuff. They're not that many. We're just we're just being psyoped into believing there that there there are many. We are the majority. By we, I mean sane people, people who are sane, people who are well-meaning, people who want what is best for ourselves, our families, and our people. We are the majority. We are the human race, and these other people are just, they're evil. They're people whose hearts have been filled with wickedness, and they have nothing to offer us except death and destruction and corruption and more and more wickedness. And so we have to have faith in our own goodness and believe that that the right and the just will prevail i think that's a excellent summary to to end on i uh, i wanted to uh, finish the show with well uh, talk uh, uh, just getting you to uh talk about your your other uh life passion which is is kayaking because <laughs> Obviously, you can't like uh, uh, just being fixated on the uh, studying the globalists all the time. You've got to have an an outlet, do do something else to to clear the mind. And you've chosen 
hiking and you and your your wife uh marie made a short documentary the way of the kayak well um yeah i i started kayaking back in the the 90s and it's just uh i mean part 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 of the attraction is it's cheap you know that I remember once we were, uh, me and a bunch of other kayakers, we were in the Hudson River, this big, huge yacht came by and making all, you know, we, we were all bouncing in the wake and we all kind of looked at it and we all looked at each other and said, I'm so glad I don't have a big, stupid gas guzzling yacht like that. I'm glad that I'm sitting here in this little plastic boat with a paddle, you know, so it's sort of like you make yourself feel good saying, we're out here with all these yachtsmen, but we don't have a yacht. We just have this plastic boat. But that's okay. You're out there, you know, the ocean liners and the freighters, and they're all going past, and you feel like you're part of it. You know, a very small part, but you're part. But um, now the movie you're talking about, I made a short film, The Way of the Kayak. Um, my wife produced it. She, she's a, a film producer and TV producer, and... Uh, It was just, um, I, I had been kayaking many years and I had always admired people who could roll the kayak because that's really the whole point of a kayak. And somehow I'd never quite gotten it. And finally, in, um, I guess it was 2013, I, I went up to Canada. Um, I, had, I was writing, I had a writing project. We spent uh, several weeks up in Canada in the Admiralty Islands, the Thousand I part of the Thousand Islands, beautiful, beautiful place, and um, great kayaking community. And uh, some people up there, um, there's an outfit called Thousand Islands Kayaking. I'll give them a little plug. You know, it's just a great, great place to go. And they were so supportive. They gave me so much support, so much training. They had great equipment uh, and and just a beautiful environment, you know, to, to just uh, go out there and do whatever you want. And so they started me on the training. You know, we, we went over the basic rescues, started on the, the, um, the rolling. And then when I came back to New York, I finally, uh, I, I hooked up with another outfit, Manhattan Kayak. And finally, I, I did my first roll in the Hudson River. Um, up near the Tappan Zee Bridge, and I got it on film. I was filming everything because I just thought, maybe I'll never do this again. You know, maybe I'll roll it once and I'll never be able to roll it again. I wanted to capture it. So I realized, you know, after a while, this let's make this a film. And it's really just, uh, it was such, when I finally was able to do that roll, you know, I don't know how to explain it except... When you're in a boat, the the worst thing you can imagine is to capsize. You know, it's like if you're in a plane, what's the worst thing? Crash. In a boat, the worst thing is to capsize. The thing about a kayak is you, you deliberately capsize. You're hanging upside down in the water. You're stuck inside of a boat. And somehow through this magical thing, that this magical maneuver that was invented by the Inuit people, you just take your, your paddle and you go like this and boom, you're right back up, right side up again. Well, once I learned that, I just couldn't stop doing it. I was doing it and doing it and doing it. And it made me feel so good. It was such a wonderful feeling that I had to share it with others. I, I just felt I have to make a film that will at least somehow partly make other people feel this feeling, what it really feels like to such a simple thing, capsize a boat, hang upside down in the water, and then come back up. To me, that's a big deal. Maybe not to you, maybe not to others. To me, that's like a huge thing. So I made this little film. It was in a number of film festivals, did very well. Um, and me and Marie, we keep saying we're going to do a 30-minute version, try to get it on TV. I uh, haven't had the time to do that yet. But we we, have, we certainly have enough footage to do it because um, I did. I took a lot of footage up in Canada and uh, in New York 
you know, I did a circumnavigation of Manhattan, which is um, almost almost 30 miles and, and uh, you know, takes eight or nine hours to do. And I, I, I went um, I went with my instructor, a um, guy named Cam. He's in the film. And we just had a just a great time, just a great time paddling and rolling and just being part of nature right in the middle of New York City. And um, it's all it's it was all filmed. A lot of it's in that little five minute film. But, uh, you know, it's just it was just uh, it was it was a, a peak moment. I will call it a peak moment in my life being able to roll a kayak, which again, maybe that just shows that I'm, I'm easily satisfied. You know, that's all it takes. I can roll a kayak. I feel like that's it. I've done it. Uh, well, it's an uh, intriguing story, I must say. And well, uh, a lot of people, they, uh, they, uh, they will have gone through life, not even kayaking and discovering that uh, that joy, so it's certainly an an interesting story. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed having you as a guest on my show to, well, not just talk about these globalists, uh, but uh, what is motivating the, the their whole operation and how how much far back in history it goes. It's been a very enlightening episode thank you so much richard thank you and i can't wait for your book your your globalism history book working um, on it take care richard and uh enjoy the the rest of your rest of your day it's uh daybreak over over there now so you too tim thank you so much thank you richard thanks for tuning in to wilms front Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.